Hey guys, welcome back. Well, it's been a while since my last video when I was talking about how M101 was formed maybe 200 million years ago. About half of you commented on my video when I released it, hey, did you get a picture of the supernova? And of course I did not. I was not even aware of it until you guys brought it up. So I'm pleased to say that I finally did get some pictures of the supernova. Plus, I've been testing out the Celestron dew heater ring. Been doing some measurements inside and outside, and I want to share those with you. So let's get started. My last image of M101 was on May 17th, and it was reported discovered on May 19th, so I just missed it. And my image on May 17th, this is not a processed image by any means, it's just got some dynamic background extraction, maybe some color calibration, is only about two hours because I was starting off imaging M101 for about two hours, then I would switch over to other galaxies on the other side of the meridian because I didn't have a good guide star for M101 on the other side of the meridian. But this is what I had just before the supernova. And as we know where the supernova is in this, supposed to be in this image, I don't see anything here. And then finally, about two weeks later, I got some clear skies on May 30th and 31st and was able to do some imaging after having reoriented my off-axis guider so that I could see guide stars on both sides of the meridian. So I got about 10 hours or so of M101 after the supernova had gone off, and now we can see quite clearly where the supernova is. It's very bright at this time. It's as bright as any of the stars in the image, and in fact, Nina uses this supernova as part of its stars for the autofocus runs that it does. Now, if we zoom in, take a really close look, you can see how bright it is, but you can also see, given where the supernova is in the May 3031 image, there is absolutely nothing over on the May 17th image. You can't even see the tiniest bit of a star that will ultimately blow up into what we see as one of the brightest stars in the nearby image of the galaxy. So it's really quite remarkable that the star went from two days before the supernova being undetectable, at least with my telescope and in my skies, to being extremely bright in just a matter of a couple of days, and it'll remain pretty bright for a long period of time. So if you're interested in getting a picture of the supernova, now's a good time to do it because, after all, we don't often get a chance to take a picture of a galaxy that has an active supernova going off in it. What you want to do at this stage, of course, is add those 10 hours of new data on with the previous data that I already had, maybe 15 hours or so, to get my total data set for M101 in my final image. Now, the problem is, when you combine the data, the pixel rejection algorithm quite effectively eliminates the supernova from your image, which is not exactly what you're looking for. Now, there's a simple remedy to this. You can go ahead and turn the pixel rejection off in your image integration parameters, but the problem is twofold there. First of all, you're losing the benefit of the pixel rejection for the rest of the image, which is actually pretty good. It's a good process to include in your stacking because it does improve the image. The second thing is, if you turn off pixel rejection, you're going to get an averaged view of the supernova. In other words, the pixels that don't have the supernova are going to be averaged with the pixels that do have the supernova. And as a result, you're not going to see the brightness or extent of the supernova that I show in my May 30th and 31st images. You're going to get some watered down version of that. And I don't want that either. So now the challenge is how do I keep the pixel rejection for the remainder of the image, but still retain all of the supernova from the May 30th and 31st. And of course, pixel math usually provides a way for us to do this. In this case, I took my stacked image with all of the images and called that the target image, dollar sign T in the language of pixel math. And I called the image with the supernova, the May 30th, 31st data, I called that the source image. And so the idea was that I was going to define this circle and I had to play with this a little bit, iterate until I got the final results that I wanted. I defined a circle roughly centered on the supernova and then wrote a script that would look at every pixel in the source image on the right and first of all determine whether or not that pixel was inside the circle. If it was outside the circle, then I would just use the value of the pixel in the target image. But if pixel was inside the circle, so little r is less than big R, then I wanted to use the pixels from the source image. And what I did here is to take that source image pixel and subtract the mean of a preview that I selected and defined back in the background area of this image, then added on the corresponding mean background from the target image. And if that 
modified pixel brightness was greater than what was in the target image at that location, I used that modified pixel. And then the result of performing this pixel math routine led me with this image. And now you can see that the supernova in the target image, which has all the data, looks exactly like the supernova portion of the image from May 30th and 31st. And so this is a good starting point. There is a bit of a challenge in processing this image because the core of the supernova is already about 60% saturated before stretching. I've been playing around with it and doing some experiments and it looks like the mast stretch process is helping out quite a bit. It takes the core of the supernova up to the threshold of, of saturation, but it does bring up the galaxy in the background and then you can do some additional processing with mass to hold that brightness level constant as you bring the galaxy back up and try to introduce some contrast. But it's well worth it because after all, if you have a supernova in a galaxy that you're imaging, you definitely want to include the supernova in there. Okay, let's move on to the Celestron Dew Heater Ring. I was using the Dew Heater Ring as I was collecting the data for the supernova on May 30th and 31st. And one of the things I wanted to do before I took it out and actually tested it, that is to say I switched over from using my dew strap, which has been working, to this dew heater ring, I wanted to convince myself that it was actually going to do something. And so I ran some tests with the Celestron dew heater ring connected up to and powered by the Pegasus Astro Ultimate Power Box, which is how I was powering my dew heater strap. I did some testing where I started off with no power to the dew heater ring, then powered up by half an amp or 25%, went up another 25%, now a full amp, then went up another 25%, and finally up to the full power of two amps going into the dew heater ring. After each soak time of about 30 minutes, I would measure the temperature on the corrector plate at six locations, and then subtract off the corresponding rise in temperature at those times in the room that I was performing this test. The whole idea here was to come up with a series of measurements across the corrector plate that would allow me to see how the corrector plate temperature changed for each power level of the dew heater ring. I stretched a piece of tape across the aperture of the telescope and put little slivers of paper on the tape to represent areas where I wanted to measure the corrector plate behind. Now, of course, the tape is not touching the corrector plate, so I just have these little pieces of paper as a guide and then used the infrared temperature measurement gun and then recorded the temperature of the corrector plate just above each one of those white pieces of paper. And then I averaged the inner two measurements together to get one measurement for the inner temperature. I measured the middle two measurements to get a, a measurement of the middle position. I averaged the outer two measurements to get the outer position until I finally got this kind of a graph. For each different power level of the dew heater ring, 25%, 50 75 and 100%, you're seeing the temperature on the corrector plate from the outside edge of the corrector plate that is just next to the dew heater ring all the way into the secondary mirror. And you can see at 25% power, there actually isn't any heating going on after a 30 minute soak adjacent to the secondary mirror, but you are getting some heating out around the outer edge of about say 3C near the dew heater ring. However, once you get up into the 50%, 75 and 100%, you're getting respectable increase in temperature. When I start up at night, I set the power to 100% to the dew heater, whether it's this ring or was my dew heater strap, and just forget about it. I don't have to worry about battery because I'm running off of house power. Some of you run off of battery, so you are concerned how much power goes into the dew heater. But I've been running off of 100% power, and that darn thing gets pretty hot. I'm pretty impressed with how effectively this ring does heat up the corrector plate. It certainly convinced me to go outside and use the dew heater ring instead of the dew strap that I had been using quite successfully. Take a look at the picture on the left here. You can see a, a little clip. This is a clip that holds the cables that come out from the dew heater ring. You've got a thermistor interface that I don't use. I'm not using the Celestron controller. It does have a standard connector for the power and you just clip those into the grooves there in that clip. Now, the one thing you want to be careful of when you install the dew heater ring is to rotate the ring around so that clip can be put in and not interfere with, say, a dovetail bar. I don't have a dovetail on the top of my telescope. I do on the bottom, of course. And you can't put it on the bottom because that clip will interfere with it. But if you rotate the dew heater ring with uh, keeping in mind that you need a 
clear space to attach this clip when you're ready to do some imaging, then you'll be fine. Do heater ring package also comes with a cable, a standard uh, connection cable that just runs back and then attaches back for me to my ultimate power box. But of course, many of you are using the ASIR Pro and it has do heater port power ports as well. So you could power it off of one of those. One of the things that I did have to do, however, is notch my Batnoff mask. I used a Dremel tool here. It's a plastic Batnoff mask, of course. So I just carved out a little notch to fit in where this clip is and also where the little connectors are for the cables coming up. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to get the Batnoff mask in there properly. And I still use the Batnoff mask. Oftentimes when I'm using this telescope, I'll do the first focus of the night with the Batnoff mask and then rely on autofocus going forward for the remainder of the evenings. The only reason I went ahead and bought this is because I was confident that I could power it off of my Ultimate Power Box as opposed to having to rely on Celestron's $300 controller. One of the nights when I was out imaging the supernova, the air temperature and dew point were very close together. I've noticed in the past with this telescope that I can expect to have dew if I don't have any other dew mitigation scheme operating, such as my dew strap, that if the dew point gets within about five degrees of the air temperature, dew is going to form. And here on this particular night, we were within that five degree limit from the start of imaging all the way through to the end of imaging, and I did not get any dew at all. I haven't seen the worst of the conditions, though. On many nights, I will see the dew point come up to and just follow directly along in parallel with the air temperature, and those conditions are particularly stressing. But the kind of delta T that I'm seeing this dew heater ring produce pretty much convinces me that I'm not going to have a problem on those nights either. Now, I'm using it at 100% power, but I bet even at 50% power, it would still do a good job. I was so ticked off that the last image of M101 I had was two days before the supernova went off. I thought I never would see a clear sky to get pictures of that supernova, but about two weeks later, I finally did get two good days of imaging and got some data. Now, half of that data has a supernova in it and the other half doesn't, so that presents a bit of a challenge, but pixel math proved to be the antidote and I was able to write a little script to copy the supernova pixels from the May 30, 31st data directly into the stacked image with all the data and still retain the benefit of the pixel rejection algorithm for the whole image, except in the supernova area. I also decided to buy the Celestron Dew heater ring, got it and installed it, and I am very happy with it. It works great. I'm supplying the power to it with my third party piece of equipment, in my case, the Pegasus Astro Ultimate Power Box. You will need to notch your Batnoff mask though, if you're gonna use this. The initial testing I did inside shows that that dew heater ring does a really good job of raising the temperature of the corrector plate. You could probably get away with just using one amp and still get through the night without any dew. For those of you thinking about purchasing the Celestron dew heater ring, I highly recommend it. It's a very useful piece of kit. Okay, guys, well, that's all I've got. I finally got my picture of the Supernova 2023 IXF and clear skies. I'm going to move on to some other galaxies now, and I'll check in with you later. Thanks for watching.